All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the coffee break and you're energized to uh, uh, tackle the final stretch of this visionary marathon. Um, uh, my name is Giorgia Guglielmi. I'm a freelance uh, science writer and also the uh, communication manager at the Friedrich Mischer Institute for Biomedical Research in Basel, Switzerland. And I have to say, uh, this is an incredible honor and a pleasure uh, to be moderating this session on the role of proactivity. In science, we have a fantastic panel that will bring a diverse uh, perspective, um, and I'm sure that the, their talks and the, the discussion that will ensue uh, will be um, inspiring. Uh, so I, uh, so for, for this session, we ask the, uh, the panelists to, uh, and then we will ask you, uh, to debate the role of proactivity in science and how we should pursue it when thinking about a better future for um, um, science. Uh, so I have to mention that um, we have two rapporteurs for this uh, session, Lucrezia Verme, which is a PhD student at AGC, and Joana Castro, which is a PhD student uh, at BRIC. Uh, they will report about the outcomes of this uh, session in the next session, so stick uh, with us. Uh, and also I have to mention that you can uh, ask questions and uh, or um, post comments on Padlet. Uh, you got the link yesterday, so feel free to uh, you know, join the conversation also online. Um, so when I uh, was thinking about uh, this session, I could uh, not help thinking about my own personal uh, experience. Um, and so when I, when I was uh, about to finish my PhD, I knew I didn't want to go into uh, a postdoc. And I, I really like to write about science, about communicating about science, but I didn't know how to do it. So I started to uh, collaborate with the um, uh, communication office at EMBL, the institute where I did my PhD. Um, and as, as I did that, I realized that I really needed more formal training in, uh, in science writing. So I started to apply for graduate programs uh, in science writing and communication in Europe and, and, and the US. And one day my PhD advisor came and said, hey, what are your plans for the, for the future? Are you going to do a postdoc? And bear in mind that this was nearly ooh, 10 years ago now. So this, that was a time where um, careers um, other than research in academia were uh, you know, consistently labeled as alternative. And uh, most of the times they were frowned upon. So I was a bit scared you know, telling him, no, I'm not going to do a postdoc. Um, and I remember that the day I just uh, started my application for a, a science writing program uh, at the MIT. And I told him, um, you know, I am applying to this very prestigious program, but you know, even in the unlikely event that they will take me, um, I wouldn't know how, you know, to pay for tuition because they, they are too uh, too high, and I will be in debt for the rest of my life. And uh, you know, I was expecting him just to tell me, ditch that that, that crazy idea, just do a postdoc. And uh, but he he told me, uh, you just apply to the MIT uh, program, and then we think about money. And um, I think you know that. He, he was right, so I guess that PIs sometimes are right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I, I eventually got accepted into the program, to the program, and I, uh, they offered me a scholarship, so I didn't need uh, to you know, ask for a loan. I was never uh, in debt for, for one day. Um, so I guess that being able to be in that environment that really allowed me and even pushed me to be proactive um, helped me to, to get the career that I have now, uh, which um, you know, really fills me, fills me with joy. So I guess one question that I have for uh, our panelists and also to the audience is really how can we create a world where, where scientists can carve their own path, be it, be it in academia or outside it, and um, you know, not feel uh, the need to, to follow or, um, uh, some uh, you know, predefined trajectories. Uh, Navnita, I know you are going to talk about careers in academia, so maybe can you answer that question and maybe elaborate a bit more on uh, you know, how uh, we can empower uh, scientists to, to grow in their careers? Sure. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Navneet Vasist. I'm a postdoc slash assistant professor at BRIC. And uh, before I begin, I'm just going to say that one of the perks of being in the last panel is that you can really recycle all the thoughts that have been said over the last two days and pass it off as your own. But I'm going to try to be a little bit more intelligent than that. Um, so that was a great question and something that I've been thinking about. And I think despite... Um, so I'm going to represent the, the, the side of the early career researchers, right? And despite us being this young, talented, and ambitious group of people, I think often we are shortchanged. 
there is a deep impact on our mental, financial health, on our uh, ability to take career decisions, to follow a career trajectory, and so on. And I think all of this stems largely from this contractual basis um, of our employment. And I think one way that we can do away with it is to rally against having these one-year, two-year postdoc stints that are so common around the world. We heard yesterday something about creativity, and then I went back and checked, and apparently there are studies amongst biomedical slash life scientists, and it shows that there are two peaks of creativity or productivity. One happens during your uh, mid-20s, and the other one happens after your 50s. And obviously, we, we try to see that creativity and productivity in full flow in the post-50s, but we are not strengthening the period when you are in your mid-20s to early 30s when you might be at your creative and productive best. So I have a suggestion, which is that we need to rethink of the postdoc um, as being more than an employee. We need to have a stipulated tenure of at least three years and moving on to maybe five years. And we need to do away with the idea of a postdoc being an end to itself. And what I mean by that is we are now in a stage where everything is personalized, from the watches that you wear to the medicines that you're going to take to everything in the world. And yet a postdoc seems uh, still a very generic uh, career decision that everybody is making. We know that there is a postdoc crisis. We know that people are dropping out of academic research. They might be joining the industry. They might be going out of, the, uh, out of science altogether. But where are they going up? And when you look at the trends, there are more people who are interested in taking up TikTok and Instagram or being a social media influencer as a career choice. There are more people interested in being in sales and marketing and start uh, startups and fintech, but not as many people who are interested in the arduous nature of science. So firstly, we need to invigorate the field of science. We need to make the scientific world seem more interesting to be in, right from the flavor of coffee that you provide in your institutes, to the environment of the building, to the career choices that a postdoc can make. So I would like to see a world where a postdoc is not only thinking about being a PI, a postdoc can maybe even think about being a scientific manager, a science communicator, um, might be going on into other roles, and we must therefore personalize such trajectories. There might be, we, we, we should offer courses, maybe in management, maybe in communication, uh, maybe in IPR law, and so on, during the postdoc experience. And this will allow people to make informed and transparent choices that will have an impact on their, uh, on their careers in the longer run. And you will have a very happy, set of early career researchers which will be in tune with what they are doing and uh, productive and they will go out of your institutes you know doing much much better than what we are doing at present uh, with all the thoughts about being financially unstable and uh, emotionally unstable that's that's uh, that we hear about at present so i'd like to stop at that i have another point about science communication but maybe i can make that later Thanks, Rubin. Uh, Silvia, we, we talked about yesterday a lot about uh, we talked yesterday a lot about uh, you know productivity in, in science. What, what do you want to uh, to to add to this to this panel? Thank you, I'm sorry if I, if I move the dynamics a little bit, but I wanted to shake the audience before we start talking, also to provoke in you some more questions. And, um, and on that, well, my name is Silvia, I'm representing a network of young research universities, but I'm not here to talk about that network. You are welcome to check our website and see our activities, and we enjoy working with Martha very much, and I would be very much appreciated that we would engage in more activities together. But first I wanted to say, to say thank you 
to Monica, to the EU Life Board, but to Marta to bring us here to organize this event. I've learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot from Marta when we engage in our Brussels uh, uh, juggling of meetings and, and consultations and things. But um, I really, I've really learned many things from you yesterday, so I'm very happy to have you given this opportunity. And uh, colleagues already mentioned that it's difficult to come in the last panel and not repeat what has been said before, so I will repeat some of these things. Um, but I also wanted to make you interact with one uh, slide of Mentimeter that should appear here at some point. You can either type in your uh, phone or computer menti.com and the code that you have on top, or if your cameras can gather the QR code, maybe you're going to be there much easier. I leave it there for a moment. And I just want to say that um, <clears throat> we learned yesterday that one of the key conditions that uh, are going to foster a healthy research system are more fundamental research, basic or curiosity-driven research, we can name it as you want, um, that is enabled of creativity, freedom, and autonomy of you to really ask the most daring questions and to allow this serendipity of collaborations and mingling with other researchers to see if another path maybe would be more interesting. We've talked this morning about the interdisciplinarity and about the collaboration and how they are essential to this process and to make us see the problems with different lenses and try to find other solutions. We are learning that these are the pillars for a healthy research ecosystem. And I couldn't help but making a parallelism with the conversations that we had today, uh, yesterday from Stefano, when he was presenting how in the new cities we are rebuilding the forest that we've destroyed. And I was thinking to myself, are we also destroying, with the political decisions that we have at the moment, the foundations of our research systems? Are we, what do we see in our Brussels uh, discussions and what do you see yourselves when you were mentioning even yesterday the, low tier, the lack of low tier levels of funding for research? We see that there is a decrease in the available funding that is given to this curiosity-driven research. And that we see that you are, as researchers, oppressed in a system that is not allowing you to have this creativity and these interconnections and collaborations. But we are also uh, faced with very key uh, policymakers asking us to be very practical, telling us that if we are giving you tax taxpayers' uh, fun uh, funds, you need to bring us a solution. And I wanted to think and tell to the policymakers how many, uh, it, the, the situation is much more complex than trying to have a linear approach between what we do research and then what, what does it bring to the market. But on a positive note, we see that there are trends that are trying to uh, put these things into question. Young researchers or early career researchers are saying that this is enough. From my perspective, this also is coming from the democratic societies. We are embracing beauty and diversity differently. And I'm gonna say that because I'm a woman, so I'm allowing myself to make this comment, but there was a moment where Barbie was only blonde, but not anymore. So recognizing these things is also part of ourselves and the choices we make. We are seeing initiatives that have been mentioned, not explicitly uh, this morning, on the reform of research uh, assessment. There is an initiative at the moment called COARA, where EU life is part of, that is trying to structure this dialogue. But sometimes we face our own research community saying, oh, but be careful, what is the alternative system? What is going to happen with this generation of researchers that are in between? We are not going to be able to move then if you are changing the system in one institution and those are not recognized in another. And that's what I'm thinking, and I really tell, in terms of proactivity, you need to dare, not only to ask research questions, but also to embrace this change as well yourselves. There are also discussions at an international level where we talk about research excellence. And sometimes, I'm even puzzled when I hear that, we hear researchers saying, well, research excellence is only the research that is recognized by excellent researchers. And I'm a bit puzzled and say, is, is not biased that in itself? Are we not biased within our own system? And are we not promoting and continuing its assistance but not being able to turn and make a change? In the same way that we are recognizing the diversity in research outputs and that we would like to have that, we also need to acknowledge that there are many different contributions that make the research system. 
in different profiles, but also different stakeholders. And we need to talk to them more openly. That is the work that we are doing in organizations such as Your Life or the one that I'm leading in Yerum. But sometimes we lack the input from the side of the research community. We don't have the time, or you don't have the time, because you're very busy with many other things. And it is said that there is this uh, curiosity-driven um, uh, aspect from researchers that are going to make you engage in different fora, but I would also ask you to be more creative in how you want to convey and take sometimes like steps like Georgia did on saying, maybe this is not the right career path, but I really like it, and this speaks to me, and enjoy on that. So um, there are two key questions that I would like to keep with the audience. Are we really considering new, wa new ways to improve the system? but in a way that we will take these solutions or these ideas to help policymakers create solutions? Are we taking an active approach to engage with those that are in the driving seat? Yes or no? I hear a lot of complaints. We hear them daily, even in this conference. Meetings are a waste of time, projects and resources that don't, they are not enabling us to deliver in the change that we want. We have deliverables, reporting, admin, we have rankings that are failing to recognize the real value, but we still tweet about how our institution is increasing its position in the rankings. We still tweet when we are publishing in a high impact factor journal. We are still proud of being part of this system. If we don't challenge this system, then who else will do it? I will just finish saying that we have really this responsibility to embark in this proactivity and None of us is entirely responsible. And we were saying, who should change the research system? Policymakers, the institutions, the leaders, the researchers. Well, everybody. And when is a good moment to embark on change? Now, every day. So I want to go back to the questions that we did. And I hope that you had been having, there were three questions. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna hope that there is a solution and let's say an answer for all of them. One of the questions was, do you or does your institution apply to Horizon Europe? I'm not surprised by this. There is a second question, if we can pass the slide. The majority of you, <laughs> I would say, you are really not happy with it, let's say. We could improve it, huh? apart from it. There you go. And there is a last question. But here I hope that you are honest with it. And this is key in proactivity. There was a public consultation starting last year and finishing in February, that EU Life participated in it, and where they ask for your input, we ask also for the input of our researchers. Not many, or not a majority, is engaging in these consultations. Well, they are the ones that are helping drive the strategic priorities for the funding in 2027. If you complain about the funding opportunities that we'll be giving in 2027, then it's too late. So this is an ask on what I trash, what I plant, when I think about our associations, we need researchers, and maybe not all of them, that will engage in our discussion, but at least we'll have this awareness of how important it is that you translate the problems that you have and your wishes and dreams for the future to colleagues like us in these associations that will transform them into policy recommendations. If there is not a good collaboration in that respect very early on, see that we are now uh, working ahead four years before the new program will start, then it will not be happy. So I hope that I'm keeping the, uh, now you will maybe have a lot of questions, so I hope that we trigger some good reactions on your side. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So you talked about change, uh, and uh, Caroline, I know you're trying to, to, make, uh, to make a change in your institute, tell us about it. Um, yes, so briefly, uh, I'm Caroline Duglaris. I'm doing a PhD in biophysics at uh, Institut QA. And the reason why I was invited here today is because in my free time, I like to measure the carbon footprint of my lab, which I will talk about here. And I have some slides. How did you get here? How did you make the journey from your research institute to the Gulbakian Foundation here in Lisbon for a 24-hour conference on the future of research? And more importantly, how do you plan on attending the 20-year anniversary of EU life? 
Today, I want to discuss a critical but often, often overlooked aspect of academia, the environmental impact of research. I am to raise awareness in each of you, highlighting the need for immediate actions to reshape our research practices. According to the 2015 Paris Agreement, we need to reduce our CO2 emissions by half before 2030 if we are to keep global warming within the 1.5 degrees target. It is essential that every sector of society bears its fair share of responsibility, and academic research should not be left behind. As scientists, we hold a unique responsibility to lead by example in this fight against climate change. We are well equipped to understand the stakes of an incontrollable global warming. The public places their trust in us and looks up to us as experts. Moreover, we have the means to reduce our carbon footprint if we are willing to undergo significant changes in our habits. One of the first topics that usually emerges when raising this subject of carbon footprint is our use of air travel, which brings me back to my initial question. How did you get here? Lisbon is quite remote, and even I could not find a train alternative coming from Paris. It is safe to assume that most of you opted for air travel because the prospect of a 16-hour bus trip is far from appealing. Believe me, it was not pleasant. Looking at the attendance sheet, excluding people from Portugal, the average distance traveled by each person in this audience is 2,000 kilometers. By plane, this translates to approximately 70 tons of CO2 for this entire audience only. Now, I'm not suggesting that air travel will be entirely forbidden for academic research over the next decade. However, let us consider the possibility of cutting it by half. There is a growing argument that travel should be distributed more equitably across academia. A 2018 study from EPFL found that professors travel on average eight times more than PhDs and postdocs. Yet, it is the younger searchers who should be establishing their networks. I have to say that I'm extremely impressed by the distinguished speakers invited to this conference. However, it is fair to assume that highly established scientists will benefit less from this event than a postdoc doing a two-month exchange for a collaboration. But let us move beyond the topic of air travel. A recent analysis from CNRS highlights that in French academia, 13% of CO2 emissions are attributed to travel. So what about the remaining 87%? Purchases significantly impact our carbon footprint. In our department at Institut Curie, we found that consumables contribute to almost two tons of CO2 per scientist annually, from production to disposal. As biologists, I believe that we have all had this thought at least once in our career. Look at all the single-use plastic that I need just to try and obtain N equal 3 on my experiment. Surely, I can find a better way. And the older generation in this room probably remembers the alternative, glassware. But it comes with challenges how to minimize contamination, manage the autoclaving of all this material. This will come at a cost from the initial investment in glass to the machines and the staff required to keep it all clean and shiny every day. And what about the energy conception of our buildings? I work in one of the original buildings once used by Marie Curie herself. And I can assure you, the insulation dates back to her Nobel Prize era. <laughs> Why am I telling you all this? Because in my department at Institut Curie, we have embarked on a journey towards more sustainable research. First, we have estimated our carbon footprint. Then, targeting our biggest emission sectors, we have organized working groups to come up with innovative ideas. And now, we are a collective of more than 25 motivated colleagues discussing with the lab direction, our supplier, and even the administration of Institut Curie to try and change things. I invite you to my poster to discuss this further. What I wish to emphasize is that labs are already prepared to embark on this transition. And they have even started without necessarily telling you, the institution. However, they cannot accomplish this alone. They require your support in terms of infrastructure, guidelines, human resources, and of course, investment. In conclusion, I want you to remember this. Scientists are ready and willing to change their research habits. They are organizing into green committees, 
debating initiatives, testing and trying new solutions at their bench. However, they are frequently met with the resistance from a static administration unwilling to help because the initial investment is perceived as too high. What you must understand is that this is an investment in our future. An increasing number of grants now require an assessment of a project's environmental impact for funding consideration. Carbon efficiency regulations will inevitably enter academia, treating it like any other sectors. Students demand that you do better as they seek to align their professional lives with their personal values. Young researchers like me are even giving up on an academic career because the environmental cost appears unjustifiable. There is still an opportunity for you to lead the way. You can rise to the challenge and spearhead the construction of the Research Institute of tomorrow. But to achieve this, you must start the transformation today. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Caroline, for tackling such an important issue. And uh, Amos will help us to tackle another very important issue, how we empower our researchers from uh, low-income countries to, to research and bring knowledge to the world. Please, Amos. Good morning. Um, I want to first of all appreciate uh, Professor Monica, Professor uh, Mata, and all the organizers for the opportunity to be here. Um, in our session, we'll be, we are looking actually at proactivity, and um, the take-home from this presentation is the fact that we have to take responsibility at national level, institutional level, and individual level. That is the summary of all I'm going to talk about. And also, I will also talk a bit about our research activity in a resource-limited region, how we were confronted with several challenges, and how we never actually accept that as a condition not to take action. Um, looking at the research centers of the future, um, as it has been widely discussed in this um, meeting, there are several attributes that is expected of the research centers of the future, advanced technology, global collaboration, environmental friendly research space, as has just been mentioned. Um, it is important to take note of the fact that we cannot talk about the future if we fail to understand where we are coming from. I appreciate how the meeting started yesterday, bringing senior professors who were confronted with several challenges and they never saw that challenges as a reason not to take action. Instead of a reactionary approach, they took proactive approach, and we are here today because of that. That shows that aiding in every challenge is opportunity for progress. Aiding in every problem is opportunity to make progress. And there are several things that we have to look at with respect to the past. What is the level of funding in the past and in the present? What is the level of research output in the past and the present? If we understand the history of the past and the current situation, it will enable us to be able to project to a better future so that we will not be going back to our past if we fail to understand where we are coming from. In addition to that, at the national level, it's important, as we are um, just being um, informed about the need to actually let the policymaker to make input, to, make, to let them know what we are actually going through. They make policy based on how far they are able to see. But if we are able to let them know um, our thoughts and our um, vision, that might inform the policy. It is also possible that we might not be able um, to influence in all these areas, but at institutional level, it's important to take responsibility with respect, for example, to provision of adequate research space for researchers, it's not good to assume that a researcher that has this limited research space will continue to have this research space in the future. We should give provision for growth, and research space should be given based on the level of project and the level of the grants that is available. This will enable the institution to grow and then it will also enable 
um, output in the institution. Apart from that also, if we are not able to make major contribution at national level and at institutional level, that is not a reason for us to fold our hands. We have to take responsibility as individual scientists. Taking responsibility by being focused on our research niche and collaborating with other people in other niches, and also to adhere to institutional policies and also to avoid um, intellectual isolation that is very, very possible because when you're looking at a particular research area, you tend to think that that is all that is to be known. But as you go, leave your comfort zone and also reach out to other people, it will be easy to be able to see the way people see. I notice a major challenge in my institution and other institutions in Nigeria. We have had researchers and professors who carried out beautiful projects, beautiful um, research, but after retirement, nothing happened. It was as if they never passed through the institution. And the reason that might happen is due to the fact that there was no plan for succession. When you leave that particular institution or when you retire, who takes over? So there should be a proactive approach to reproduce ourselves. When we are gone, the lab should not close. There should be people that will take over. That will lead to raising the next generation of researchers, not just at the early career level, but even from elementary school, to break down what we do, to break it down to the level at which they will be able to understand at the secondary school level, at the undergraduate level, to break it down at their level, tell them what we do, you know, different um, methods of communicating our research to these people. Perhaps one of them might take interest in what we do. Um, in conclusion, before I talk about some of the activities that we have been carrying out, um, the research centers of the future will not happen by luck. Like somebody said that success is a matter of luck. Ask a failure is not a matter of luck. It is based on what we put in. You can never get anything without making major investment. The future that is not envisioned may never be created. And collective responsibility at national level, at institutional level, and at personal level, we go a long way to create a research center of our future. Um, taking proactive approach, like I mentioned earlier, after a postdoctoral research in my, um, with my host, Professor J.B. T. Rocha in Brazil, I was with him for one year um, to carry out a postdoctoral research, and I returned with two vials of flies. And I was um, surprised to find out that I could not locate any lab where they actually use the fly for research. And this is the summary of what we do in our laboratory. Um, we look at the environmental impact of some contaminants and then that can predispose to different diseases like cancer and also Parkinson's disease. And um, we have been able to, like you see, I started in my office when I returned in 2014. Um, from 2014 to 2017, um, there was no space. Due to space constraints, I started in my office. And it took um, about three years before I was able to give, to be given that other space from 2017 that we are using um, to date. And then in June 2022, we got additional space that we are using for uh, molecular lab. And in December 2022, we separated the flies from the main lab, and now we have a fly up. So we have grown from a small office to having the fly up. Um, and also, we also, due to the fact that we have limited resources, we fabricate and also try to see how we can innovate. For example, I found that Drosophila incubator costs up to $5,000, um, $10,000. But what we did was to get a chiller for you know, um, cooling drinks. And we spoke with an engineer. Can you convert this to an incubator that will give us constant humidity and constant temperature? And we'll, by that process, with um, less than $1,000, we're able to have three incubators, and we bought more. The safety bulb cabinet also expensive, we we're able to also fabricate that with less than um, $100. We were able to fabricate this. Also the chemical film yield. And due to demand for training, um, we set up the Sophila Research and Training Center to ensure sustainability and continuity of our research. This is 
um, the research um, center. And also, we have carried out outreaches in order to read next generation of researchers um, from 2020, 2020 up to date. We carry out research uh, um, outreach also to um, reach out to researchers. Also, undergraduate students and several other people. Next month, again, we'll be having another outreach where we are bringing together 20 undergraduate students from across Nigeria uh, for training. I would like to appreciate um, EU Life again. And I thank Professor Ross Kagan and, um, for the opportunity to collaborate with him. Our center has been able to sign an MOU with University of Glasgow, and we have a five-year project that we are carrying out in collaboration with them. Um, Catacom Sciencia, Mariana visited our lab for two weeks, and um, she was able to transfer some materials for um, workshop to undergraduates as, um, as well as primary school students. Aids for Lab gave us 20 um, feet container filled with equipment. And that was what, that is exactly what we have been using in our laboratory. We, these are other organizations that have supported us, and these are the um, team members and our international advisory board, as well as our collaborators. I'm grateful once again for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any question relating to this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amos, for showcasing these fantastic initiatives. Yeah, Janusz, do you want to conclude uh, this, this uh, you know, inspiring panel? Yes, I was asked to uh, talk about proactivity in science in seven minutes, and in order to make it in time, I need to use my speaking notes. So um, thank you very much for inviting me. I am Janusz Bunicki. I'm a professor at the IAMCB in Warsaw. My group is interdisciplinary. In our research, we use experimental methods, in particular cryo-EM, to determine structures of RNA molecules. And we develop computational methods to build models based on experimental data. I also have some experience in science advice, both in policy for science and in science for policy, and also have some experience in collaboration between science and art. And yes, and I was asked uh, to be provocative, and I will try to do this in three points. So the first is, are we effectively using science to shape our future? From my work in the group of chief scientific advisors to the European Commission, I learned this. Scientists, like everyone else, interpret information based on pre-existing narratives. We hold on to our beliefs, and we tend to reject facts that contradict what we believe. To use science fully, we need complete expertise on a given topic. So we cannot solve complex problems alone because of our limitations. Complex problems require more than just natural and life sciences, and they need social sciences and humanists with their scientific methods. And we also need to learn, listen better to others, what they have to say. And actually, we scientists are not really trained to listen. We are trained to talk. <laughs> and how often we actually listen? and how often we, we bring in all the relevant expertise in developing our research, in running our labs, in planning new institutes. Probably not often enough. Um, so if you want to start a new scientific institute or launch a new research initiative, maybe a new educational program, I think it would be wise to use all the scientific knowledge of all the disciplines and not just limit yourself to what you think about it. Um, so, no offense, but all you individuals here are seriously limited intellectually as, in, as individuals. <laughs> my director is in the audience, oh my god, what did I say? <laughs> but we are less limited as a group. And I think it would not hurt to use more social sciences in many things in life sciences, in particular in designing how we work, how institutions are built, what are the dynamics between the people, and how to help people go through a change, for instance, when they adapt to new conditions and when they are about to take part in a new initiative. So second, when the scientist gives an advice, it's not necessarily a scientific advice. It's just someone telling what they think. Scientific advice, from my experience, requires a synthesis of all knowledge on a given topic. And it's a very tough job. A single person cannot really do it all, and typically, the whole team of experts 
uh, needs to be used to gather all the information and then to systematize it and synthesize it, so then another group of experts can interpret it from many angles. We are flooded by information, struggling to separate solid scientific facts from noise and from, from various fakes and, and hallucinations of artificial intelligence. But I think we still can do better with artificial intelligence. Imagine an AI model, maybe kind of like ChatGPT, but not necessarily, specifically trained to assess and synthesize all the scientific literature that exists on a given topic that we want to, to, to have uh, knowledge. It could identify not only the consensus, like ChatGPT would normally do, but also find conflicting reports, some issues where are different conflicting data, and maybe remind, remind us of published hypotheses that go beyond current paradigms, but someone published it somewhere in some obscure journal. Usually we cannot find such things, and very often such things can be very useful to understand a given issue from, from, from many different angles. So I think an AI trained specifically for that purpose could do much better better and faster than human experts. But then, a synthesis of the knowledge provided by the AI should be always critically analyzed by a team of knowledgeable experts with different backgrounds, looking at the problem from many angles, taking into account many different values and many different beliefs. Yeah, so th third point. Um, as I said, our feelings and values determine how we interpret facts in the context of our pre-existing narratives. Whenever we are encountered with information, we always automatically uh, interpret it within the narratives that we already have. How can we use it better to shape our future? Not just a handicap, but as, a, as an advantage. Of course, AI alone and science alone should not plan our future. We are humans first and scientists only second. So I need to ask you for something. Please close your eyes now for two minutes. I know that you have interesting stuff on your laptops and, and, and smartphones, but you know, it can wait. Please close your eyes. Otherwise, it won't work. Imagine where you want to be as a person or with your team or with your institute in two, five, or 10 years. You can pick whenever you want. Visualize this future, which you are happy with, and where and with whom you are there. And don't open your eyes. Just imagine it. Imagine a happy place where you are happy. Don't open your eyes. See it. Feel it. And remember what you see, and remember how you feel. So now, without opening your eyes, think about how you got there from the past when you started. Now you can open your eyes. Okay, the future that you visualized exists. You have seen it. And you can now tell a story about how to get there because you've been there. This is called, this is a call, this is a tool called leading from the future. Okay? You just generated a future, a possible future, and the path leading to that future. I'm going to ask you to share this vision with at least one person today. Okay. Describe a future that is as rewarding for that person you're going to talk to as, as it was to you, as how you felt it. And then listen what they have to say. So in short, I propose that the proactive science needs first diverse thinking to break through our intellectual bubbles Second, AI to cope with the information overload. And third, future visioning and storytelling and narratives to make the future. So feel free to try this exercise at home. You know, close your eyes, visualize the future, share that vision with others, and listen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janusz. I, I told you this we were going to be inspiring talk, and I'm really happy uh, that, that you that you joined. And thank you uh, again to all the speakers for uh, for for sharing their thoughts with us. Um, I now want to open uh, the floor for discussion so that we can overcome our intellectual intellectual limitation as individuals. Uh, are there any questions for our panelists? 
Okay, maybe maybe I can I can start uh, with a question that I will maybe touch upon uh, what Navneet wanted to, to add. I want to, to bring to the discussion also how we uh, can help uh, researchers um, uh, to be proactive in engaging with society. Yeah, so I think the, the kind of engagement we are doing right now is very reactive. We tweet or put things online once our papers are published or we wait for the opportune moment when it's the World Health Day or World Earth Day and we put a series of tweets or uh, arrange a meeting or something of that sort. So my proposal is rather to turn it around. There are There is a lot of tools, both digital and in person. Uh, there was a very interesting post uh, yesterday about using virtual reality and I would think that that's something that we need to push forward. Uh, there are also several ways of doing this in practice in person. We in, uh, implemented one such uh, endeavor. We, we designed an escape room adventure where we invited school students and we designed a activity which lasted almost a couple of hours. And they had to solve four different puzzles all based around the scientific experience. And this is something that can be done on a very shoestring budget um, using already uh, present resources that we have at our institutes at our disposal. And I think the engagement that you will then get is mu many, many fold higher. And it's not, it's not just mere content generation for the sake of it. So I, I suggest what we need to do is think of, think of ourselves and our um, commitment to the community, develop a sort of a parish, develop a community where we invite local schools, maybe local bodies, uh, patient organizations, uh, maybe other uh, science enthusiast groups which might be around in our cities and have a more regular uh, interaction with them. In Denmark, we, are, uh, we, we have something called as the Culture Night which is uh, happening once every year, um, and it's, uh, it's when all the public institutions are thrown open to the public, and there are many, many presentations, games, uh, talks, etc., that are happening. I think that's a fantastic endeavor, something that, that should be started everywhere, but it's not the only model. There must be uh, many other ways by which uh, we can carry forward the same idea, but I think we need to proactively engage with the community and not sit uh, waiting for something like COVID to come and then try to then go out and talk to people about vaccines and antivirals. I think that's the thing that we are doing wrong with science communication. We are often reactive and not enough proactive. Does anyone else want to comment on this? Okay, if not, we'll take uh, Monica's question. Like all of you, it was really inspiring. Very, very, very nice uh, proposals. Uh, and I have uh, two different questions. So one of them for Sylvia, which is, uh, I think you put it very right, that people don't, it's very, Brussels is very far away and we don't uh, uh, participate and engage. And would you suggest ways in which we can promote that engagement within our institutes to younger people? And then one to Amos. So um, how can we, like Institutes of View Life, and you've seen what we do as an alliance, be also more proactive to reach out to countries like yours and to promote more collaboration in between you know, Europe and outside of Europe? Would there be ways that you life could engage more? I take first, uh, Monica, your question on engagement. and. Um, <coughs> Uh, I think it goes back to uh, many of the things that we have uh, commented on the responsibility and how in our society we tend to place the responsibility on others and we are asking for our rights all the time and we have become a little too comfortable. And in terms of policy making, I think you need to really think of a little plant that you're watering every day. And sometimes in researchers, we, you want to see the tree that will bring you far away, but the work that the organizations are doing 
with a small working groups where they ask you for your opinion, when they ask you for priorities as leaders, should we embark upon on this topic? Should you start a, a consultation group on Horizon Europe for the next four years? There is a part of responsibility to invest that time. And in many cases we say, well, I have so many other things to do. What am I gonna learn here? And it's not only for you, but it's what are you going to bring to that that will then make these collective positions that then are meaningful to engage with policymakers. So for me, it would be more taking the responsibility to engage. Sometimes you may not see the future <laughs> very clearly, but it's contributing towards it. And there you have leaders that are driving you into the right direction, and that would be something very important. Thank you so much for the question. It's a very important question. I realize that um, we have more of North-North collaboration and than of North-South collaboration. North-North, you are in the North, US, Europe, um, other developed places. So South-South, I mean South, less developed um, countries. Um, it will really, really be um, nice if you, um, as you are in the North, that you collaborate with less developed um, regions like ours, um, it will really, really be something that you will be happy with because you will see value for little investment, little input into the South. For example, like I told you, um, with minimal amount, we were able to innovate, improvise a lot of things. When we, we had a collaboration with um, a professor in Harvard University, for example, and then we look at, um, after the, um, we got a small grant, out of that grant, the amount required to pay a postdoc, we sustain several laboratories in Nigeria. The amount required to pay the salary of a postdoc in this region can actually go a long way to um, develop and train several scientists. And to be able to initiate this collaboration is by identifying um, people that you think you can work with, either um, maybe people that have visited, that you have identified, or maybe through the government. But sometimes um, when some letters get to the government, um, sometimes if the person that received the letter is also having some interest, it may never get to the institutions, it would need to not really go around. So to be able to initiate the collaboration um, is to identify different labs, different institutions that you think you'll be able to work with. And it will really be a good thing to do. And I advocate on behalf of the um, resource limited regions of the world, Africa and other places, that you should please um, show us some consideration and collaborate with us. The diversity is there, like Professor um, Brindley mentioned yesterday, genomic diversity and several things that you are looking at based on um, this environment, you'll be able to see new perspective when you collaborate with other regions. Currently, for example, we are working to be able to identify colorectal cancer patients in Nigeria and other West Africa, and we identify 64 patient data in Sibao Porter, and we are trying to see how we can generate flights to create avatar flights for each of these patients and to look at compounds around that we can use to treat. This was made possible as a result of collaboration with Professor Kagan that I mentioned earlier. They had actually carried out the studies in Caucasian or other people in US, but they now found out that there are some diversity, there are some um, differences with respect to expression of these um, genes in Africa that is different from what they have actually been used to. So it will really be something that will be mutually beneficial if collaboration with less developed countries are engaged and also um, put into the policy 
with respect to the research centers of the future. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, you talk about uh, diversity and Silvia talked about bias and I was, um, you know, wondering how can we uh, be proactive in, uh, you know, distracting biases. Um, I'm talking about um, researchers from different countries, different ethnic backgrounds uh, with uh, visible and invisible uh, disabilities, um, neurodiverse people, we didn't even touch on that, but how can we make sure that all these people feel comfortable and, um, uh, in, in, in you know, pursuing a career in academia or research or, or elsewhere. Um, that's a very interesting question and um, difficult to answer, but I would say the first thing that comes to my mind is we need to be all more humble. And we are still, we need to acknowledge that we are part of a very elitist group of people still. And with our struggles in academia, and in research careers, still if we compare ourselves to other sectors within our own societies, we are still seen by them as privileged. And taking that into account and see how our own problems can also help the problems of others could be one of the solutions. But colleagues were saying it before, listening more. And it's embracing the fact that indeed we can have, we are asked to give a lot of solutions, but as researchers, we should all acknowledge the fact that we don't know how it goes, but we can help you take another solution. There was something mentioned in, um, when, uh, in policy making, that sometimes there is this dialogue of researchers don't know how to talk to policymakers. And I'm a politician, and I have to take a decision. In, 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 my citizens are asking me to take a decision tomorrow about something. And I ask a scientific advice, and they will tell me we need much more evidence or much, much more research to give you a conclusive answer. And probably still there, we will tell you. Uh, we cannot 100% guarantee you that we will, you know, you will be able to do this type of activity or this measure will be right. We need to bridge a bit that kind of understanding of, of what others need from us and how not everything will need to respond to our own needs, but how we really need to respond also to the others. Yes, I'd be gladly add to this. So yes, um, um, actually, again, about the, our own cognitive limitations. I mean, we humans, including the scientists, very frequently uh, and very incorrectly assume that others who are with whom we are in contact know and make sim know the same what we know, believe in the same that we believe, and they make the same assumptions as we do. This is almost always incorrect, and uh, instead of and this is very very difficult to go against the typical pattern of your thinking that instead of assuming that, you, that someone else knows something or believes in something or needs something, you need to ask. And then you need to listen to the actual answer, not just ask what they need and then stick to your previous assumptions. And this is very difficult and this requires practice. And uh, maybe not everybody should, should do this, but whenever there is uh, an effort to bring in uh, some, some new future, uh, it's good to divide the roles and have some people who actually are uh, good in asking the right questions, listening and understanding, and then maybe translating what these other people uh, think and want to the, to the kind of narrative that we have so, so, so it fits. Because uh, it is, it is a, it's, a, it's a tough job to bring together people who have two very different narratives. And sometimes there should be some, 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 some translator or someone who can sp speak with the facts in slightly different way that would appeal to both of the narratives and still remain true to the facts. We have a question here in front. Hello, thank you for the panel and you're extremely diverse so this will be a very interesting question to me. So as a, as a fact it's like pro Proactivity has a cost, right? It's outside of your defined job title, your job role. Although we are scientists, we have quite a broad spectrum of tasks, but this is usually outside of it. And the cost is usually both personal, but also um, there's opportunity cost, because you have a skill set and you spend it actively on something you are not using, maybe the skill set or something else. Science communication is a very good example of that. And 
Also, productivity is often groups or institutes not equally distributed. So it's usually a spectrum of some people who are ducking out of everything, more or less, or are never proactive and focus only on their agenda. It could be a good thing also because they're really good at what they do. Um, and there are people who kind of take on everything because they just have the need and they see that this has to be done. So how do you think about it? Um, how can we more equally distribute this proactivity, activities that just have to be done? Should it be a separate job role? And um, how do you think about the associated costs, both for you personally, but also the opportunity costs that arises? Thank you. Karen, do you want to take this one as you do two different <laughs> projects? That have no different Maybe I can <laughs> answer a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's true that when we started this project, this was a, a weekend project, evening project, sometimes day project, but I don't tell that to my supervisor. Um, and uh, one of the difficulties is that uh, if you want to convince people to move on every topic, I mean, I'm talking about sustainability, but I, I guess it's true also for science communication. First, you need to show them results. You, have, uh, you need a proof of concept, and then finally they can start to trust you and invest in, in you. So you have, I mean, I understand why it's like this, like when you write a grant, you need preliminary results. So you need to show them preliminary results that you do in the weekend. Uh, but for this, uh, I was really lucky because once we had this one year of preliminary results, um, I uh, had the opportunity to be funded as a, an extra mission during my PhD. So this is kind of like a consulting mission. And now it's officially recognized that I, work, I can work a certain amount of time during my day job on that. Uh, and so it's really important to be able to invest financially in the people who, who want to, <laughs> to make a change. They also gave us a 6,000 euro grant to try to implement the policies uh, that, we, that we want. So let's, yeah, recognize that. Um, so I, I would like to comment on from a different angle. So um, uh, when we are now in, in, in the present, there's lots of noise. Many things are going on, many things are happening. There's lots of near future uh, becoming the past with lots of noise, and we want to grab it all because, I mean, it, it's all just, everything is going to the past. Something that was present five seconds ago is now in the past. You cannot catch it anymore. Um, and when you're in the future, in that visualized future, remote future, you are above that noise. You can get clarity and know what you need to do to get there. And this can help you make some of the decisions in the present. Probably not all, but you know, like by if, if you if you exercise this and stay in the future for a moment, for some time you can you can get rid of that noise. It's in a way it's kind of similar to I mean the, the benefit of, of 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 flying plane to a meeting is that you always see blue skies, regardless of the weather. There is some moment where there is just perfect weather where when you are flying, whether it's a day or or, or or at night, and this gives you clarity because you see the ground and the clouds completely differently. Things are moving, the shadows are moving and so on, but you see a clear sky. And when you are in the future, you, know, you, you can get this kind of clarity for a moment. Then you land and, and then you know what to do. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, I wanted just to uh, comment following on Caroline, um, uh, on the I mean, we saw it yesterday as well with Alex Jordan. I don't know if he's still with us, but he said, all these things, I'm doing them on my extra time. And when I started, it was a 7 p.m. meeting. Um, so think about when you're going to a public administration and then somebody there explaining bureaucracy smiles at you. Smiling is not in the job description, but they took the extra mile to make your life happier, let's say. Think about it like this in, in one aspect. We can't restrict only to what we are meant to do. We need to think ourselves on how we can expand the impact and the value that we provide within our own positions. If Marta and I would have been waiting for having the enough resources or having everything detailed in our job description, our organizations will not be where they are today. But then we have the discussion of the reward system. And it has been mentioned here several times. And this goes also very much about the own recognition. Do we recognize Georgia as science communicator as part of our research system in the same way as other researchers are contributing to it? I'm sorry I put you at the spot. But are we recognizing our advisors in the European research offices of your institutions that are contributing to get you the grants in the same way as yourself? 
That it happens indeed by how politicians will change also this reward system, but it's also on how the community will recognize yourself. Enrique this morning said as well, I'm a physicist. I decided to explore in history. Many of them say, what a waste of time. That part of the recognition comes from us. And recognizing the different disciplines in, a diff in the same way and giving them weight comes from us also recognizing this, this diversity. And comment uh, really quickly on something else that you said that it's always the same people in the lab who want to do this and that and this and that. At the beginning of my PhD, I wanted to do science communication and women in science and all of that. Um, I'm really sorry that it goes a bit against the proactivity thing, but sometimes you have also to learn to say no to some things and to channel your energy, or otherwise you're just going to exhaust yourself. I think that Nature, they published something about that. There was a no group, and for one year, they just said no, no to the, all the extra tasks that they knew they could not reasonably accomplish. So don't say no to everything, be proactive, but don't exhaust yourself, especially because sometimes they don't value it. Even if you do, we still work in a, an environment with constraints and where you have to cer tick certain boxes. Okay, so, so uh, we, we thought a lot about the future uh, in this meeting, and there is, um, you know, I was reading the, 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 the program, and there is a, 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 a manifesto, I would say, from uh, Giulio, and he talked about language, right? So I want to uh, ask this, uh, you know, slightly provocative questions now, if we talk, if we think about the future. Uh, you know, and all the, the things that you discuss, how to be proactive and, uh, you know, try to make a change. Do we have to change our vocabulary, you know? Uh, are things like groundbreaking science or, I don't know, academic path still part, will still be part of our vocabulary in the future? Or if anyone from the audience wants to answer the question. Is, is the language the most important thing that we should change first? Maybe not. I think it's important that the message gets uh, in, in the form that it's understood. But for this, we maybe don't have to change the language. You have to care better about who is there to listen and listen ourselves better without actually changing the language, but paying more attention. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, there is uh, research on emotions that is telling you that if you are not able to put a name on certain emotions, then you cannot feel them. So language indeed is very important. Now, I don't know if indeed is the main thing that we need to change right now, but we need to make sure that we are able to go deeper whenever there is a need to explore the specificities of what we do, but that we are also to go broader to explain with simplicity what are the key things that we need. You as researchers, as leaders, when talking to your communities with the struggles that you also have in driving institutions forward, because we are always asking leaders, you need to improve, you need to do this better. But how many times we know that then some decisions are unpopular for the researchers themselves. And in the long run, maybe they are good decisions, but there is an inevitable reaction to change, no? So maybe it's a bit a combination of both, but indeed we will need to work on more facilitation and communication and maybe translation. Let me uh, add one more thing, because you said about emotions, and this is absolutely critical. It's actually, it's more important to speak to the emotions than to speak to the sort of scientific ear when we are talking about the change. Because, I mean, making a new future requires a change, and this requires leadership, and leadership is all about helping people go through a change, and change is usually difficult, because we are not only getting something new, but usually this new is uncertain, but there is a loss. Whenever there's a change, there is a loss, and you are losing something that you know. And it's hard. And there are emotions. And there's grieving. So in order to make a change, one has to have a leader, or be a leader, to help the sufficient group of people with like-minded uh, goal, to, to help everybody go through that change and through that loss. And this requires focus on emotions. The most important thing is to ensure that the message is passed and everyone understands what the message is all about. It's important for every um, venture to have a vision and a mission, not just that is understood by the leadership, 
but it's also understood by the researchers and all the other staff of the institution. For example, what is the vision of your institution or EU life um, in the next 10 years, in the next five years? And to now pass it down and ensure that everyone concerned understands what this is all about. When they understand it, it will be easy to um, flow along and to be able to achieve it. I think we have uh, now three minutes left, so just uh, maybe the last uh, question uh, to Navneet. I want to come back to your point of um, engaging with society. You didn't touch on, or you, you, you touched on social media when you were uh, giving your pitch. Um, but how can we, can scientists or institutions use social media to, uh, you know, reach out to young people? Uh, I guess, and also not, not so young, as so many, many leaders here scrolling through their Facebook and, and LinkedIn feeds. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, be because there are so many research leaders and I know that they love cliches, I have to say that I'm going to use one. Uh, it's the low hanging fruit, guys. Social media is so easy and it's so accessible by literally everybody that it's one of the easiest ways that you can tap in. The problem is that there is no way to measure the engagement. Sure, Twitter will tell you so many people clicked on your tweet. Sure, TikTok will show you how many people watched it or YouTube will tell you how many people watched the entire video versus only 10% of it and so on but there is no measurable outcome of how many people you've been able to make a difference to. So while I support people who want to get on digital tools and, and use all of them, please do. They are a better alternative than doing nothing and sitting on our backsides. But I think, I think there is value and there is quality when we engage with people one-on-one. -on -one. And we are a social species the last time I still checked. And more than the dopamine hits that we get from our screens, I think we can make more lasting uh, communication when we talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that's the reason why we're all in this room rather than being on a Zoom call. Um, so I would suggest we need to use it as a combinatorial tool rather than using it as a, a, using as a one or the other. So social media can complement what you do in real life but I don't think we should be replacing it for all our communication needs. Does anyone else want to give a quick, okay. Just very briefly, there is no measurable outcome, but maybe we could work towards a qualitative outcome to measure the interactions in social media. And that's when we ask again the community to give us the solutions to things that may are not ready, and we may need to, to look into that. Thank you again to all our panelists. Please join me to, to thank them again for their inspiring <laughs> talks.